on fire. Fire is reserved punishment for God Almighty. That's these people are completely going against the tenets of Islam. You know. So that's how strong our religion is. But the people are sadly they're especially the young people, they're misguided. By whom? By those people who, who do evil things. So I'm just I'm sorry, I'm gonna add something to that. Yeah. Um, Rudy and who the libertarian Joel. Joel uh, Gardner. <laughs> Uh, invited me to speak at, at their libertarian talk show that they do a podcast mm -hmm. uh, once a week, once a month? Once a week. Once a week. And I went to his office, and I walk in. I'd never met Joe. And, you know, at that time, I didn't think a whole lot of Rudy. Just <laughs> honestly, where's that? So he, he goes, but I thought I would really appreciate the opportunity to speak out on his forum. So the first thing is he had a computer screen open with a meme about Quran. Remember this? Mm -hmm. And it says, you know... Ten things they, that you should hate. No, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Be careful. These ten things that are true about Muslims and Islam, right? Something like that. Mm -hmm. And one of them was, yeah, women, treat them terribly. Little girls, do whatever you want to to them. And that's okay. And it's Quran. Ver, uh, chapter such and such and verse such and such. They did a great job because nobody's going to fact check. They said, oh, yeah, they, they're quoting the Quran right there. So Rudy and I... I said, let's fact check this. Let's open up the Quran and see what it says right there. And it was completely the opposite That's of like, what it was saying. If you're going to accuse a Muslim woman of doing wrong, you better have three good witnesses or you're going to get 80 lashes. Yeah, you yourself will be in trouble, not the woman. That was the section they were citing on to say that a Muslim could mistreat women at their pleasure. So anyway, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh I'm, for all this time, and I've been uh, I've been brainwashed evidently, but all of us are infidels. What else do you call us? Christians? People of the book. What, what People does, of the book? What does infidel mean? A Muslim, mean? Uh, uh, an infidel is one who does not believe in God Almighty. Period. Basically. So that's an atheist. So when these guys run around with infidel on their shirt? That are Christian? They're saying, I don't believe in God, is what they're proclaiming. I'm an atheist. In, 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 the, in, in the eyes of a Muslim. So a Muslim can marry a Jew or a Christian. So how can you? How are you allowed to marry a Jew or a Christian, and then I'm supposed to also kill him? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And and like I said again, people can take passages from the Bible, the Quran, any book, and say take two. I could tell you the Bible says kill, but the word right before it's don't. <laughs> right. So I mean, people do that to all the holy books. Uh, Anwar, I, I guess let me clarify. I, I wasn't trying to justify a terrorist attacking whatever what what uh, as a, a standard Fox News watcher or whatever down the street they're gonna say oh America USA would never break a treaty and we won't know about it because Fox News hadn't told us are, are you aware of <laughs> All kinds like, of treaties. treaties been, we've broken against the Indians and stuff. Oh, absolutely! Oh, okay. Not just yeah. against the Indians. And then, you know, it was funny. I, I had I had the honor of going to the White House and having dinner with the President of the United States, then George W. Bush. Okay, they have an iftar dinner every night. Uh, once one night at the White House during Ramadan. And I thought they invited just people like me. But it was actually like ambassadors from a lot of, like there's 150 ambassadors from all over the world and about 15 or 20 regular people like me. How I got invited specifically, I don't know. But I found my way up there. And I so happened to sit at table nine, which was George W. Bush's table, right? And he comes and he says a few words. I figure he's just going to send one of his underlings, greet us, because I've been to these kind of functions before, not at the White House, but the State Department. And the undersecretary comes in and says, hi, how y'all doing? Thank y'all for coming. It's a hobnob event with like leading Muslims from all over the world. But this was like, 
hi, I'm the ambassador from Russia, I'm the ambassador from Italy, from Kenya, from wherever, right? So I, I sit down and I have the, the ambassadors from the prime minister of Kuwait on my table, the ambassador from uh, Qatar, from Bahrain, the chaplain from the army that's Muslim, and George W. comes in. I'm like, oh my God, there he is, he's actually here. So I'm taking pictures of him, you know, up there, and, and I'm thinking he's leaving, and he comes and sits at table nine. That's his table. That was for that event. So I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, to him, and I'm like, you know, my daughter's had a hard time me coming up here tonight because of our policies in Iraq and in Palestine. What do I tell them? That was the nicest way I could put that question, right? <laughs> so he talks and he talks and he goes something about, well, you know, we had UN resolutions to go into Iraq. And I'm like, okay, you're a Republican and you're telling me UN resolutions and we're going to follow them. Okay, I'm like, I'm going to keep my quiet. I'm, you know, I'm trying to keep my, be polite. I'm at his place. <laughs> he's hosting me and, and he's the president of the United States. So I said, but Mr. President, did you just say the UN? He goes, yes. And I'm like, since when did the UN matter? Or do we just get to pick and choose what we get to enforce from the UN? And he knew exactly what I was talking about because of all the stuff that against Israel and all the lands they took in their aggression in 1967 and what have you. So he goes, you're absolutely right. We just get to pick and choose what we are. So we get to pick and choose what treaties, what resolutions we want to enforce or not enforce and that happens all the time it's just not just it's well, happened until today right most of us pick and choose which part of our holy books we want to yeah follow what we want to do and what we don't like and what we like yeah get the redacted tr translation <laughs> i'm sorry i don't know what redacted means, means black out. out oh okay all right <laughs> yeah <laughs> he wants to ask it. Yes, the teacher wants to ask a question. question well i got a question I got a serious question, but it's probably a good time to, number one, say we really do appreciate you hosting us here, and you've been, you know, just gracious hosts and mm -hmm. put on a good feed and everything else, you know. Mm -hmm. And and we appreciate you. I mean, you came and you and, uh, and Ahmed and... Uh, Taha. And, the, yeah, the imam that visiting. was here then, uh, visiting, uh, you know, came to our group and answered a lot of tough questions. I mean, we asked some very... They weren't tough questions. They were... Loaded questions. They were no, they were worse than loaded questions. I'm looking yeah. for. Them. They were, condemning they were, questions. yeah, condemning questions. And what he said to say for this, you know, and we, we asked pretty tough questions. Um, and, and I appreciate that. And and you said, you know, that you love the Constitution. You invited us to come. Said we we love America. We love the Constitution. Uh, we're actually happier and freer here than we are in any other country in the world, including Muslim countries. And so we we appreciate the Constitution. It'd be great to we'd want to learn about. So it. so go ahead. I'm, can no, I say no, go something? Ahead. And sure. then you can finish up. So, how many Muslim countries actually follow as rule of law Sharia, Sharia law? So in the world, you can't answer that question. You're not allowed to answer. Sorry. So, how many countries, or what's the closest country that follows Sharia law as it is right now? Depends on who you have to find Sharia. I actually no, looked Sharia that up, Sharia. and I've got, it's, got it a map of maybe. Right. I don't know, eight or you think, countries and some You think maybe right? Saudi Arabia? No, because they're in no. an anarchy and you can't elect your leaders. You think Egypt? No, because again, no real true elections of leaders. You know, in, in Saudi Arabia, they don't allow a church to be built, and that's against Islam. Uh, Is it Malaysia? Malaysia? No. They're big big. No, there is no country in the world that's... Predominantly Muslim, that has Sharia as its law, and the reason for that is because you have egotistical leaders that don't they want to do what they want to do and not allow the people to govern themselves like it says in Islam. The one that's most that's closest to Islam is the United States of America, because freedom of religion is part of Islam. No compulsion in faith. And protecting those that are not of the same faith is part of Islam. Freedom of speech, freedom to assemble, no illegal search or seizure. I can't go and, what you do in your home is your business. I can't go prying 
into Islamic principle. I can't go pry in what you do. Now, if you bring it outside the home, that's a different story. So, for instance, you hear that if somebody caught, commits adultery, they get stoned to death, right? You've heard about this in Islam, right? In the Bible too. But they have to have, is it three or four credible witnesses that witness the act of adultery? Four. Four. Credible witnesses. And the fifth one is, is the liar. And the fifth is a liar. So you have to have four credible witnesses. Who's going to commit adultery in front of four people? So it's really hard. In Islam, it's really hard jurisprudence to reach the punishment of it. And accusation of whoever did adultery. To accuse someone, you know, act of adultery. No. Yeah, that's Just because they're flirting in the public, that doesn't mean yeah. they committed adultery. The other thing you hear about is cutting off a thief's hand if they steal, right? So during um, Khalifa Omar's time, this guy was brought because he was the judge. He said, this guy was caught stealing. So he, they asked him, why were you stealing? He goes, he admitted, yeah, I was stealing because I, can't, I, I work... I hold down, I work all the time for my boss, and I don't make enough money to be able to take care of my family, so I, I stole. So Omar summons his employer, and he goes, the next time this guy steals because you're not paying him enough to feed his family, we're going to cut off your hand. <laughs> okay? And that's Islamic jurisprudence. And, and Is it not the first time? If you got, I think it's the third time? You, then you get yeah, there's a lot of jurisprudence. I don't know all the rules, but I'm just, you know, I'm trying to make, you know, just give a the gist yeah. of it. And, and when you say jurisprudence, is that similar to like rabbinical law where something is... No, it's like if this, then this, then this, you got to go through all these steps to get to the cutting off the hand. But that's outlined, all the steps are that's outlined right. in the Quran? And, or, and the traditions of Prophet Muhammad. 